This meeting is being recorded. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody uh, to this week's Solar Noon Tuesday. And as per usual, I'm going to go ahead and start off with uh, what I found to be the news uh, in the solar industry. And uh, so the first bit of news is that California recently passed uh, legislation indicating that uh, you must now uh, do all of your solar permitting online. I think this applies only to residential solar at the moment. Um, and it's instant permitting, online permitting. So they use programs like Solar App, which uh, allows the uh, person who's applying for the permit to fill out using their process. And um, then if you meet their templates requirement, it integrates artificial intelligence, then you'll get instant approval on your application. So as this diagram shows, um, there's actually been, I'll point to it right there, there's been a lot of um, um, issues, for instance, in Tucson, Arizona, where it takes 24 business days to get an application approved. And that's not that unusual. So, so now you're gonna cut down on some of that time. So we'll see that, I think that's a trend that we're gonna see in a lot of uh, cities. Uh, this is supposed to go into effect next year on September 30th for cities greater than 50,000 and um, then the year after for cities less than 50,000. Another sign of the time is uh, companies are out there marketing what they're referring to as microclimate monitoring systems for, um, for solar. And these are installed on large uh, commercial systems and also utility scale systems. They provide real uh, time data tracking of the climate, uh, sunshine, wind direction, humidity, things of that nature that are hitting that solar array. And they're anticipating that will not only help you in um, generating and maximizing production, but may also offset some troubleshooting type things. So if there is an effect, you can see if it's weather related. So that's kind of another interesting sideline. Uh, there was a report that just came out. I think it was from Generation 180. It's a, a nonprofit group finding that one in 10 schools in the United States have installed solar arrays uh, over since 2015. So that's a significant number. It represents about 8,400 different schools, uh, about 6 million students. So we're starting to see these things really finding their way into uh, public education for one thing. I think we're gonna see a lot more government um, buildings. And of course, with the Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed, um, nonprofits can now receive that tax credit as a refund or a rebate, as opposed to um, having to go with a partner who uh, uh, a for-profit partner in these projects in order to uh, take advantage of the tax advantage. So I think we'll see some of those schools getting into that. There's a new uh, drone-based uh, rating system. Now the drone base is the name of the company, but it's also drone-based. They're doing an evaluation of sites and these sites, it's like a school letter grade kind of situation. These are for commercial and, and utility scale projects as well. And they're going to be monitoring things like power production, um, hot spots, um, temperature of the array, uh, things like that. And they're giving them a straight letter grade. So for example, if they evaluate a system and it has less than half a percentage of hot spots on the um, uh, solar array as the drone flies over that would receive an A, but if it gets more than two and a half uh, percent of the cells are showing hot spots, then that would get a D. And what they're anticipating is that they would begin to use this like with um, with utility uh, scale systems for financing and for investors who want to compare one project with another, and that the developers can um, also um, uh, brag about how good their systems are. They'll just post letter grades, similar, I guess, to how they do corporate bonds and, and even, I guess, restaurant letter grades, things of that nature. Um, there is a um, report out by uh, McKenzie Phil, uh, Wood, 
Wood McKenzie, is that the company? Um, anyway, about um, battery storage um, systems. They're anticipating largely, again, due to the um, Inflation Reduction Act, because now standalone storage systems qualify for the tax credit, that they're going to see a fourfold increase in storage connected to the grid in the next two years. So we're moving from about uh, 13 and a half gigawatt hours of storage connected to the grid that will be installed in 2022. But that shoots all the way up to 45 and a half gigawatts in just two years, 2024. It's going to be a huge increase just in a very short period of time. Uh, the headwinds that are going against this is the, um, the Uyghur Forced Labor Act, because a lot of this material is coming from the Uyghur area of China. And in order to sell these products in the United States, you've got to demonstrate that through every level of production within the, your supply chain, they did not use um, forced labor or, you know, that's kind of a euphemism for slaves, you know, slavery. So I think everybody will agree that's a good thing to make sure that that doesn't happen, but that's going to be something that's going to be delaying uh, perhaps supply chain issues when it comes to that kind of dramatic growth. So I really um, anticipate that that it's going to grow, but I think four times in two years, that seems, that seems pretty aggressive given all of the issues that we have with supply chain at the moment. So that was the news that I had. Um, I don't know if Tony is on the call. He sent me a link uh, just before the call, but I didn't have a chance to, uh, to take a look at it. Um, is, Tony, are you on here? Yes, sir, I'm on the road, but I am, I am on. Okay, did you actually read what you sent me? Do you wanna give a quick synopsis on that? I did. So this article, and I, I haven't, I mean, I, I, I looked at, I think a, a couple sources, um, after I saw it, it was kind of explosive. So it's a, and I can drop it in there. I'll drop it. I can drop it in the chat here. <laughs> well, hopefully you're not driving. <laughs> no, no, no. I am, I am, I am just in the car. Okay. Um, okay. So there it is in the chat for kind of everyone to see. CNBC article, I mean, I was kind of shocked at how little coverage that this got, but you know, according to this article, this was published the 1st of September, Amazon took all U.S. solar rooftops offline last year, um, kind of citing a bunch of fires and electrical explosions. Huh. On their facilities, I'm assuming. Correct. Uh -huh. Now, I haven't, you know, I haven't dug too deep into this, but I thought it was pretty you know, no pun intended, pretty explosive kind of article that wasn't really covered by anyone. Um, they went into like a lot of detail on, you know, dates of the fire and, you know, what's happened. There's a lot that uh, kind of points to not great installation, well, obviously, right? But sure. when you see something like that, it kind of, you, you you, you scratch your head of like, you know, what Amazon's, you know, not some, not some two bit, you know, organization, right? Like this is an extremely advanced, extremely well managed organization, and they've had multiple fires on their fulfillment centers to the point where, like, they've had they, you know, according to this, they've they took them offline. I think they were on like a 200 facilities or I mean, 176 facilities. That seems odd because you would think if it was systemic within them, it'd be systemic within everybody um, that we would be hearing from, from other folks. That seems odd. Exactly. There were so many things that, that I thought was odd, right? Like one, like the, that, that, that it happened, right? Like this. Yeah. Two, that it didn't receive a whole lot of coverage. You would think that all of the anti-renewable wankers that are out there would just have like created a feeding frenzy about this. And, and I didn't really, it kind, of, it kind of like wasn't super well covered. Mm -hmm. But then also like, you know, what I'm interested in is like, was it a, 
Did they sole source the manufacturing? So it was like one company that put them all over the United States and they just screwed it up and repeatedly screwed it up throughout all of their facilities, which would, which might explain it, right? It was a single point of failure, you know, poor practices or, and or the same kind of hardware selection that caused multiple fires. But I just thought that this was kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, a, a huge a huge story that wasn't well, wasn't covered well at all. I mean, probably good sure. thing for, for folks like us, but yeah, I just wanted to, I'm just interested to, to know your thoughts or to see if you saw this pop up anywhere. No, yeah, I haven't seen it at all. Um, you would think, of course, just when you talk about explosions, you think batteries, you know, I, I don't see, uh, it, it could also be some perhaps arc flash issues, but that would have to be at a connection point. So maybe they got some dodgy combiner boxes or, you know, like you say, if they're using the same product at every location and it just so happens they use some, you know, off the back of a truck, cheap, you know, combiner box or something. But I mean, how much danger is there in solar just hooking it up and wiring it? It's not, not very common to have those no, things happen. It, Exactly. And I think, you know, what was obviously pretty apparent, and I'm not you know, super upset or surprised about this, but you could tell like whoever was writing this article, like didn't, you know, wasn't super <laughs> technically well versed. We'll say that to put it lightly. Sure. And so, you know, they had this picture of the article that was this, uh, apparently like, you know, the firefighters on the roof and this little, this little fire. But yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you. Like what is causing you know, did you just put electrical explosions to be bombastic or was there actually some real explosions or like you said, arc flashes? And it didn't say anything specifically with energy storage. It was just, it made it sound like something with how they were wired yeah. caused the fire on the roof. Um, yeah. But it's like the, the rewire. I mean, they, they lost millions taking these taking these off, right? Sure. To try to figure out the, the, the genesis of this problem, so. Well, I, I made a note to myself because what you're bringing up there, um, maybe next week we'll, we'll look at fires, solar and fire. Um, you know, I've done some presentations to fire departments about the unique issues around homes and businesses where there is a fire, whether it's related to solar or not. Um, that they have to deal with because the solar equipment is there on the building. So maybe we can well, talk on that for next week. And so there, there, there is a paragraph that says a little bit more, you know, they may kind of sound like it was a little bit hush-hush. I don't know if that's true or not, but critical fire or arc flashes, so Jay, to your point, and, I, and it happened in six of its 47 North American sites with solar installations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Bob, you had a comment. I saw your hand. Yeah. I I think that the cause is they weren't installed by ETA certified people. Yeah, that's probably it. They need to they need to get proper training. So <laughs> there you go. Yep. Um, I, I think and it may very well be that uh, we've seen some of that with some of the low bid. You know, they go out, they use the cheapest equipment, they get the thing up, they do it in a hurry. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't take much to to mess something up. So. Uh, quality, quality install. So let me look at uh, solar and fires because because one of the issues that we run into with a fire, let's say there's a solar array on a home and the house burns down and the first responders show up and start picking through the rubble. Well, in the daytime, those solar panels could be generating some, some volts and they're just lying amongst the wreckage and these guys are used to looking out for nails, but they're not looking used to, you know, picking up a, a, a solar panel and getting electrocuted, you know, so, so that's one of those issues they've got to look at just firefighter training. Um, so when DVM did their study of uh, did their, their maybe last year, in their, their PV module scorecard, uh, they talked about the fact that you can, you can, you can roboticize the whole process of manufacturing panels. The one part that's really difficult to have a robot do is putting on the junction boxes on the back of the panels. Uh -huh. And they had a number of those that were where the junction box was burned up. 
uh, where they showed that, you know, they had pictures of the junction boxes that were, you know, blackened because of the, the fire in the, in, the jun in the junction box. Oh, you mean they just spontaneously combust inside well, the panel? Probably a short yeah. at, the, at the point where they go into the junction box. Yeah, I always tell the students that they should when they receive them, you know, check the polarity for sure of those panels because some, you know, 12 year old Chinese kid is probably hooking those things up and, and it's easy to reverse the wires inside there. And, uh, you know, unless you're checking that, um, you know, it's just usually a little dollop of solder in there and they're just connecting a couple of things. So, so yeah, it's good. And maybe do a visual inspection as well you know, pop that box open and, and take a look to make sure something's not hanging by a thread, you know, inside that. Because I could see that happening where the, the soldering is just not secure. It's not good. And over time, it works its way loose. So, yep. Uh, G, um, from Selenium America, when solar insulation takes place on um, facilities like gas stations, is this separate um, code requirements on that that have to be observed for those type of insulation and that type of facility? Yeah, on a on a place where there's uh, explosive or combustible material nearby, um, like a gas station, is that what you're saying? Yeah, uh, I have not heard of anything um, that is is different. Um, with those kind of facilities, of course, you don't want to be connecting your ground wire to to an under uh, to a buried gasoline tank, um, but you can connect it to a buried water tank. I mean, those are acceptable grounds if they're metallic. So, um, uh, but I don't know. Has anybody heard of anything? Any spe specific hazardous site um, requirements for solar installations? I would assume it's similar for all electrical. Um, you know, if if it's safe to have grid tied electric, it should have should be safe to have solar electric as part of that install. Would such an installation be classified as hazardous location? And um, would there be special requirements for solar installation on any area that is classified as hazardous in detail? Yeah, again, I haven't heard of anything specifically that way. No. Yeah, you, it, in a gas facility, you can't just throw up a solar panel if it's in a classified, like a class one dip two or class one dip three. You absolutely have to have it so many feet away from a transmission source. And that depends on the, the area you're in. Would that be the same if I were just hooking up any electrical at all um, to that location? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's there's roles for any kind of ignition source. It all has to be in its own place away from vents and so on and so forth. And that goes for solar panels as well. It would mm -hmm. all have to, have to be intrinsically safe and then there'd have to be arc flash equipment in the panels itself. And... Okay. All right, does anybody else have anything on the solar news before I jump into a little bit about corrosion? And then we can, of course, bring up whatever we want. Look at everybody there. All right, let me. Um... Um, Jay, uh, it's not really a news question, but could I ask an open question? Sure, sure. Um, so I was speaking with a friend of mine yesterday. He lives in California, and he wanted to go and get um, basically like a solar solution with batteries, uh, so that in the event of an outage, you know, he would not be dead in the water. And right. he told me he had three quotes from different installers, and all of them told him that he could not set up the system in that way, that basically all your power goes to the grid and you draw power from the grid. Does that sound reasonable um, or make sense to you? No, <laughs> no. Um, I mean, obviously if it's a straight grid tied system, that's the case. But if you put in an AC coupled system or a DC coupled system, which is very, very common. Um, you know, in fact, I, I read somewhere about 50% of the systems installed today in residential are going to have some sort of battery backup. Um, but what they do is then, of course, they disconnect you from the grid when you're in standalone mode. So uh, yes, as long as you're connected to the grid, you, you, 
you can't be exporting back to the grid uh, if the grid is down, but these systems sense that the grid is down, physically disconnect from the grid, and then you operate in a standalone mode with batteries. And all so, you need is an auto transfer for switch or something like that to disconnect you from the grid. Okay, so you haven't heard of any crazy regulations that say that you can't have a battery or you can't be disconnected? No, Could you know what? Uh, this is in California. Yes. This is in California. Yeah, see, they just passed a law that you have to have. All new buildings must be designed with battery backup in mind. So they're going just the opposite. They're saying you have to be able to, to do this. Not, it's not a matter of you're not allowed to do it. So it just didn't make sense to me either. Like everything I read, California is the you know, biggest proponent of solar. You know, like why, why would they make you not use a battery, you know? Yeah, well, they're kind of schizophrenic in some respects in that, you know, the, the elected officials seem to be very much proponent, although the, the Public Utilities Commission seems to be kind of going the opposite direction in California, where they're trying to, they're looking at that net metering 3.0 where they're um, anticipating reducing the amount of money you get paid for power that goes back on the grid and charging uh, an exorbitant fee in, in my estimation. I think it's $8 per kilowatt of solar that you have on your home so, uh, per month. So if you've got a 10 kW system on your home, you've got to pay $80 a month to connect to the grid, which is, is crazy. I mean, that's, that's insane. So on the one hand, they're promoting it, they're, they're requiring it even. And then on the other hand, in another department, Public Utilities Commission, they're kind of trying to make it non-affordable. So, you know, I guess it depends on who you talk to, you know, and they, we're a schizophrenic country, you know, so. I, I have one more thing to ask. Um, so do we have, you know, brothers and sisters out in um, California that want to go and do like a, you know, barn raising type of installation? You mean like, uh, yeah, uh, I, I suspect that. Who knows if anybody's on the call here from California. Um, I, I suspect the regulations in California are perhaps a little more strict than here in Podunk, Appalachia, Ohio, where anybody can get together and install a solar panel. So there might be some, some regulatory restrictions on volunteers going out and helping, probably specific to the, the location, you know, the jurisdiction where you're doing it. But- um, Okay, I, I just want to put it out there. I think I've mentioned to you that I want to do one like in the next six months for me, but then I want to get a couple more under my belt. So uh, I'll be trying to, you know, promote it to friends and family. Sure. To get more experience, you know? Yeah. Anybody who's on this call or seen it online or whatever, if you have uh, an install that you want to do, lots and lots of folks, um, just like Eric there, who, who want some experience, are willing to come out and, and just help um, install just to get the experience of doing it. I, I've probably got, you know, 40 students who would love to, to help out at different locations. So uh, free labor, I guess you got to feed them, give them a beer afterwards, whatever. So no not, problem. Not, not during, okay? No beer during the install, but when it's all over, go ahead and get drunk. So, all right. Um, anything else before I jump into the corrosion thing? We had promised that promised Bill, um, we we're going to talk about corrosion. And also I decided to add a little bit about certifications. Um, panel certifications, because I, I found that when I was looking at them. But the issues around corrosion, um, when, whenever you're in a saltwater environment, and that's what, it, what brought it up, uh, you're talking about the corrosion of the racking, specifically electronics is another issue, and the panels themselves. Um, although the silicon panels are, are pretty good, um, unless there's a break in the seal. Um, this, uh, anything that corrodes is going to lower the performance of the panel, and there also could be voiding of the warranties. So uh, I did look through some of these solar panels um, out there, and if they're not specifically certified for saltwater environments, then installing them in a saltwater environment could be considered as 
something that would void their warranty. So be sure to look at that if you're in a location near the beach, um, near the water. But even in some of those uh, folks who are in northern climates where they use salt uh, to do melting of ice and, and that salt can become airborne, you know, uh, so, so you may have um, corrosive salt corrosion taking place even though you're not next to, uh, next to the ocean. Um, we did have, I think it was Gabe down in Houston, sent me an email about this. And he was talking about, um, he's installed a solar array on, on his home, which is, I think he said something like 30 meters from, from the ocean. And uh, he's not had any, any significant corrosion issues in, in the number of years that he's had those things installed. Uh, so that's, that's something just his testimony um, on it. Um, I should point out that the mm -hmm. panels themselves, there is this norm now or, or standard that's out there. It's the IEC 61701, which is the salt mist corrosion standard. And if you're looking at panels in this environment, just make sure that they are UL 61701 certified. If that's the case, then you should be you should be fine for the panels. Um, there are going to be other issues like like the equipment that itself or the the wiring or things of that nature. Um, but in this in this standard, it's it's kind of a confusing standard. I looked through it. Um, it's kind of weird. They started out with level one, which they said was suitable for seaside. Um, installations. Okay, that made sense. But then they said, okay, level twos, not even going to be used. We're going to skip over that. And then they went three, four, five, and six, each one being a more rigorous test of uh, resistance to um, salt mist. Level six being the most rigorous of, of these tests. And what level six said is that it was exposed to the equivalent of 112 days of, of salt exposure with less than a 2% output loss from, from the, the panel. Um, now what they've done since this standard came out is it seems like they've decided anything less than six is kind of to be ignored. So when you get certified to that UL um, 61701, you're gonna be certified to a level six um, level of protection. And, and, um, and they issue these certificates um, as, as part of that. The other thing is as far as casing, um, you can get NEMA 4X rated cases, uh, equipment cases for, your, your inverter, for example, or your uh, combiner boxes or disconnects, pretty expensive. They're certainly more expensive than the standard 3R or, you know, these are considered waterproof, but they're also considered corrosion resistant. Um, so, so they're, and they're mostly made of stainless steel. I think I saw a few of them that were fiberglass, which, which made sense, but um, these are, these are supposed to be totally immersible. I mean, you could immerse them in water. They're, they're waterproof, not, not water resistance or moisture resistant. Um, so, so that's an option there. Uh, they also mentioned something about the anod, uh, the aluminum itself, if it becomes corroded, tends to form a level of corrosion that is protective from further corrosion. So you might get a, a coating of what looks like corrosion on aluminum, but then it's not gonna go deeper. It's not gonna like rust all the way through like steel does. Um, so, so that's something to consider that it has sort of its own unique way of um, protecting itself, aluminum does. And a lot of our panels are aluminum, um, at least the structure. Now I did a search online of just trying to randomly look at some of these panels. And um, I found a lot of them that are bragging that they are salt water resistant. So there were some certificates like this just posted in their documentation that they've met the level six criteria. So I think that's 
something that's out there, something that's widely available. So, um, you know, if you're installing in an area where that's going to be an issue, I'd suggest you look at that. And then while, while I was looking through this, I found some other certifications. Um, and, and I just thought this was kind of interesting to take a look at. Some of the things that solar panels are dealing with is not only the salt water or the salt mist corrosion, but there's a ammonia, ammonia cor corrosion um, that takes place. And this becomes an issue in, in uh, agricultural install installations where there are a lot of farm animals because the ammonia comes primarily from urine. Uh, it might also come from some fertilizers that they're using. And these things can become airborne. And I guess ammonia will cause corrosion to these materials like anything else. So there is a unique standard around ammonia corrosion that you can um, get, get certified to on some of these panels. And then there's some other, you know, some damp heat testing, temperature cycle testing, and, and of course, PID. Uh, PID and LID are things with solar panels. PID is potential induced degradation. And, and that's something that deals with when you get into the higher voltage systems. Um, and, uh, and it has to do with the way that it's grounded. And so the, you, can, you can get panels that are resistant to that. Light induced degradation is another thing, LID you can get panels that are uh, specifically uh, designed to avoid that. And some of those like LID and PID can be pretty dramatic. You can lose a significant amount of power um, fairly soon after they've been installed. Um, looking here, I see some other long-term sequential testing. I, I, I saw that they've got these things called thresher tests and long-term sequential tests. And as I did the research on that, they weren't super clear about it, the thresher test and the sequential test, other than these are manufacturing tests that they do that speak to the durability, the long-term durability of, of the panel. Uh, I couldn't find out why they call it a thresher test. Everybody just called it that. Maybe it's named after Joe Thresher who came up with the, <laughs> the test or whatever. So um, one of the, yeah, one of the, the tests that they use, both DNV as well as listed here, is the PID free, and that's potential induced degradation. Yeah, uh, and it's and so it's voltage, and it applies to string inverters far more than it does to micro inverters because you're talking about voltages that can be anywhere from a string can be from, you know, 195 to 1500 volts, mm -hmm. whereas the micro inverters are operating at maybe 47 volts. So some of these tests apply to some things, but not as well to others. Right, and, and I did find that um, when I was looking at um, uh, LID and PID, those, those things, they tend to be more prevalent when you get up over a thousand volts. So that's one of the reasons why our traditional residential systems here in the US, it's not been a big deal to most residential installers because they're not dealing with voltages greater than a thousand. But once you get into commercial installation, then it becomes a big deal and you wanna to look to your panels as making sure that they are in fact resistant to that. And I think most of the major brands, that's kind of a thing that they built into it now. I see that in, in a lot of those. Well, they've, they have, uh... They've also tested them in Munich as well as in, let's say, Algeria or Morocco. And so in the very hot climates, say Barstow, California, or you know, someplace like that, they have a lot more problem with LID or, or LITD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the, the losses can be pretty dramatic. I'm just going with memory here, but it seemed to me, you know, there were situations where you'd install the system, you test it, everything's fine. And then within a month, it's losing like 75% of its production. And, and folks are just going, what's, what's going on here? And, and it has to do with that. Okay, I'm going to throw us into the gallery, sort of throw this open. Um, 
that that was pretty much what I had on corrosion. Does anybody have anything they want to add on that? Or oh, I, I forgot to mention galvanic corrosion. Um, galvanic corrosion, of course, is when you attach dissimilar metals to each other, and uh, you can find that it will essentially turn the metal to powder over time. Uh, very common is when the uh, ground wire, the unprotected um, grounding conductor, uh, touches the aluminum frame. And, and if it's left like that, it'll bore a hole right through the aluminum. It'll bore a hole through the, the copper. These things will disintegrate over time. So you want to make sure that they're not, not touching each other. Uh, you can use rubber, rubber gaskets or washers. You can use... I. I'm 99% sure that uh, stainless steel is like the O positive of these metals. You can, you can use those as you know, like stainless steel washers between the two, but probably rubber would be a little bit more um, forgiving um, when it comes probably to- Probably 316 though. Oh, 316, only 316? Uh, well, I'm not sure. I, okay. I, I'm it's just saying kind of there's, there's different, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so those are issues that you wanna make sure that you're, you don't have dissimilar metals um, touching each other. That, that can cause a big problem. I ran into this when I did some roofing. I used uh, galvanized nails on a copper um, flashing. And like two years later, I came up and all the nails had just turned to powder. You know, nothing was holding them on, but they just completely disintegrated. So Bill, you had a comment? Yeah, I have more of a question. I'm wondering if Devanand or, or some of the others who are in a marine environment have found uh, things for say a ground mount frame or a pipe a pull top mount or other types of mounting structures that are other than just galvanized steel. Have you found anything that is maybe a fiberglass tubing frame or, or something like that that is resistant to corrosion? Yeah, where we are in Caribbean, yeah, um, pretty much everything is carbonized. Um, haven't had much to do with pole mounted, but some ground mount system and rooftop racking, try to stick to the aluminum um, rails. Um, when it comes to like electrical conduct boxes, we go to our electrical manufacturers, they will probably coat it, powder coat it, zinc coat it as a colony to try to reduce the effects of the, um, the corrosion, depending of course where we're using it. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. remember on, on galvanized that it is a um, coating, it is a zinc coating. And if you puncture it, you've broke, you know, where the puncture is, it'll corrode right away. And in fact, it accelerates corrosion wherever there, uh, there's exposed steel. Uh, I, you know, it just occurred to me, we, we installed a ground mounted system uh, we raised it up and used it as a livestock loafing shed. And uh, so they were um, in there and, and actually had bedding underneath, but it had the Schedule 40 galvanized poles. And now that I think about it, wherever the manure touched the uh, pole, it, it just rusted straight out. Um, so, so we ended up cleaning that all out and not putting any bedding there just to reduce some of that. So that's probably some of that ammonia corro um, corrosion that's taking place there because nothing else rusted other than just where the manure was touching. So that's another thing to consider. Just uh, recently, any... just recently um, I went and looked at a, a ground mode system in Trinidad. Um, they use um, Unistruct for the rocket, right? Galvanized, zinc coated. Uh, what I observe is that the spacing between the panels, <laughs> all the spaces when the panel where the, the unit they were rusted. Oh yeah. Not, not the, the exposed part of the unit shot outside was not rusted. Yeah? So that was confusing me. Of course, when I felt the, the in between the space, I noticed it was very moist around those areas on the unit shot. So I assume that because of the for some reason my just be collecting an additional moisture there. And those are carbon um unit shot as I say um mm -hmm. Okay, yet on all the space in between the those showing um, signs of corrosion. Okay. Yeah, so I the was, excessive moisture, of course, is going to be a contributor. Yeah, Bill. I was told once about a uh, a large wharf. It was a multi-million dollar wharf that someone had put in. 
it was a, an aluminum one that was supposed to be last for ever. And about four years later, it had collapsed into the ocean. And what happened was that the sea urchins would collect around the foot of the, the piers of the aluminum piers of the of the 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 tier of the pier, the the poles or the pipes that supported the, the pier. And as they would brush their tentacles, they would brush off that protective coating of, of <laughs> oxidized aluminum. Uh -huh. And they just basically sawed their way right through the piers holding up this this gigantic wharf. And it all collapsed into the ocean about four years later. Uh, the unintended consequences of, of, of uh, urchins there. Jason, did you have something to add? I, I saw you there a second ago. Yeah, I just want to say that you're never going to get rid of all corrosion. The best way to combat corrosion is A, you go to coatings that can be replaced easily, and then you put that system on a preventative maintenance schedule. I put a lot of equipment outdoors, and I can tell you one thing. We paid a lot of money to keep water out. Water gets in. Yeah. <laughs> eventually, you have, to, you have to inspect it. And sometimes you even have to inspect systems on a quarterly basis or a monthly basis, depending on your environment. So that, I'd say you can spend a lot of money and, and try to do the best you can. You'll never eliminate it all. Just inspections is where it's at. You got to keep an eye on your system. That, yeah, one of the articles I read uh, preparing for this, they said, you know, marine paint, it's a nice thing, you know, just keep painting the surfaces. Uh, I don't know how practical we paint over top of the solar panels will protect them. Yeah, you know, but, right. Uh, how effective will they be? <laughs> so. Jay, a question I'm asking this. Get away from solar, look at those offshore wind farms where there's a lot of metals. How do they manage that corrosion? Yeah, well, a lot of money. Yeah, that's one of the things that we talk about in our wind class is, oh, my gosh, the maintenance and the cost associated with those environments is is dramatic. It's just huge. And you put them out there in the ocean. You know, it's one thing if you're putting them in the Great Lakes, which is a freshwater environment, but you put them in a saltwater environment. And yeah, it's a lot of a lot of maintenance. So. All right, anybody else have anything to add to the discussion for the good of the cause? I was told at one point I was built, I was putting up a ground mount with a large welded steel frame and we were going to use stainless steel anchor bolts for bolting it into the concrete. And uh, and there was we were told that <laughs> that was you, Bill. Duck mail. Yeah. Um, we were told that there was that the stainless steel has a higher galvanic index than just regular steel uh -huh. and that we might actually have more problems with with stainless steel than we had with with normal steel bolts you know three quarter inch steel bolts uh so i don't know how to deal with that how to process that in terms of in connection with aluminum because all of the screws on any of your panels are going to be stainless steel. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I had some heard. of it has to do with the mass of the individual metals. Like one is like if one is like, what do they call them? Uh, anyhow, there's you can look it up online. I'm sure there's a if you're like you can use stainless steel with copper, but if you and you can use aluminum with copper, but if there's more aluminum than there is copper, then that's bad. But if there's more copper than aluminum, that's okay. You know, so it's like weird like that. I'm sure there's some of that like anodized goop that you can put on it to uh, retard some of that. Bob, you had a comment? Yeah. Uh, so if I put silver dimes with my copper pennies in my pocket, they're going to corrode. <laughs> Eventually. Although, right although anymore, you won't find much silver and much copper in no. any of those. So uh, <laughs> it's all... It's all something correct in your pocket. You need to spend it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's Bill. There's different grades of stainless steel, and this, and you can tell the cheaper grades of stainless steel are, are still magnetic. So if you take a magnet to it, um, and it says that you got a cheap grade and it will rust on you, stainless steel will rust. The mm -hmm. this what I'm using on my installs is a higher grade uh, on the anchor bolts and stuff like that. And they don't corrode 
and they're not magnetic and they ch charge four times more money for it. Yeah. Uh, the worst is galvanized, which is zinc. And they have, everything is zinc and it, it doesn't meet any mill spec whatsoever. It, it's the worst thing out there. Even your zinc coated pots have to be re-zinced every four years. Uh, so uh, the next grade up is a nickel. Um, so nickel in, in uh, a plating will start meeting mill specs as far as corrosion are concerned. Mm -hmm. So there are volumes of books just on this subject showing the different type of uh, materials. But uh, if you buy a zinc screw or something like that, just throw it away. <laughs> well, that that would seem to me to to sort of lend lend credence to buying a complete engineered system package that's warranted, like your racking systems or whatever. And and they're typically pretty pretty complete. And if you have a problem, mm -hmm. you can go back to that manufacturer and say, hey, you know, Iron Ridge or whoever you're dealing with, you know, I have a problem and I used all your stuff, so. Um, that might be worth paying a little bit of extra money to do it properly up front. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty much it for today. Um, and I'll, I'll look into the fire issues for next week. We'll see you all next Tuesday. All right. Hey, Jay, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Uh huh. So um, I got a letter from ETA about like annual requirements. I uh -huh. didn't really pay attention to that. So what do I have to do to make sure I'm, you know, certification is, you know, in in order? Yeah, you can um, you can submit to them. I think it's eight hours a year of continuing education, and these sessions are worth thirty minutes. So if you go into our website, SolarPVTraining.com. There's a whole list of them. Uh, if you just pick the ones that you've already attended or, or look at the videos, it'll generate a certificate and send it off to ETA automatically. So okay. if you did 16 of those, you'd be covered. Or you go to any any training, um, you know, submit your certificate to ETA and, and that'll take care of you. I don't think it has to be eight hours each year. It just has to be, um, you know, or it's six hours, six hours each year or 24 hours over the over the four year period. So you could do it all in the last year if you needed to. How okay, is that cool. how is that different from NABSEP? It's not, except I think ETA is a little more flexible um, as to what qualifies and what doesn't. Um, I think NABSEP, they have to be approved ahead of time before they will consider them as continuing education whereas ETA will do an evaluation after the fact. Okay. Thank you. Sure thing. Okay, see you all next week. Take care. <laughs>